Yeah, yeah. Roberta says correct that he is in Florida. All right, so I get asked a lot of questions when I do these presentations and I love doing these presentations. I hope that kind of shines forth that I just, I love teaching. It's one of my passions in life. If I knew how to teach, I don't know, tatting doilies, I'd probably be teaching tatting doilies too. Um, but I, I want to consider some of the questions that I get asked. And one of the questions that I get asked is what kind of equipment do you need to do iridology really well? Well, I want you to stop for a moment and think, think of this analogy. Okay, let's pretend you've got a 2015 Chevy Cruze car and it needs to go to the shop because it's making a funny noise. Maybe your neighbor, though, is mechanically inclined and does a lot of his own auto mechanic work. And um, he's looked at it and he doesn't know what's wrong. So you really are going to have to spend the money to take your car in. Are you going to take your car to someone who has a toolbox full of tools but hasn't updated anything in their tool repertoire in 20 years? Or because your car is newer and it has a lot of computer stuff in it, do you want to take it somewhere where they've got the ability to actually hook your car up to the computer and do a proper assessment? Okay, so the same analogy works with iridology. Ultimately, you don't actually need the newest and the most expensive imaging equipment, but if you are actually going to work with clients somewhere along the way, you're going to have to invest in good quality equipment. I'm going to walk you through where we start with equipment and where we want to end up on a, on a fairly consistent basis with our equipment because it's just so important that we not, 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 did I say that three times? That we not cheap out on this. Okay, that sounds scary maybe, but I promise it's really not. This is the equipment that I like all my students to start with. And it's just simple. It's not expensive, um, but it's a really great place to start. Now, why would I start my students here? When my students start with me, they, they may have some iridology background from other places, but likely they don't. Likely they're curious. They've maybe seen an iridologist and they want to learn this or they're a holistic practitioner and they want to have a tool that will help them to integrate their herbology and their iridology and all the other things they do. And so they don't yet know if they love iridology. They don't yet know if they're going to be really good at it and if they're going to actually be able to comfortably integrate it into their practice. So I start my students out really, really simply. Now I keep this equipment on my desk because I still use this, right? I still use this with my clients. The equipment that you see on the screen is 40 years, well, some of it's 40 years old, some of it's newer because I decided I wanted a better, a different um, light. So this is my magnifying, lighted magnifier thingy, magnifying glass, that would be the right term for it. And I like this one particularly because it's got uh, three interchangeable lenses. These are the two I use the most. This is a two power, which you can use for assessing the color of an iris, but not much more. This other lens is a five power, and that's really nice for getting in close and seeing what I need to see. If I feel like I need a little bit more, then I come to this. This is, I don't even know if they make these anymore. I looked this up online. It's an Agfa loop. So it's made by the Agfa lens company. You can see it's an eight power and a pen light. And so this gives me a little more detail. You never want to go higher than a 10 because at 10, you start getting lost in the eye. Things are so magnified. You don't even know where you are. So I really strongly suggest to my students that they just simply start with this kind of really basic handheld equipment while they are learning iridology, while they are deciding if they love it or not. Now, why do I like these? I like this because it's one-handed operation, right? Turn it on, bring it in from the side, have a good look. It's one-handed operation. That makes it so easy. But if I need the detail of the eight, then I'm going to put the loop in one hand and the light in the other and come in and 
this is important. This is really, really important to have a separate light. Even if you're gonna use this as your main magnifier, have a separate light. With this one, your light is fixed in one position. And it's always going to be in the same position in relation to the lens. Sometimes you actually want to move the light to a different place and leave the magnifier where it was because moving the light casts shadows in the eye. We think that, the, that our iris is flat or that it's smooth and it's not. It's very textured. And sometimes we want to see those textures. So I always suggest that my students buy a magnifying light, lighted magnifier that has interchangeable lenses. And if they can get up to an eight or a 10 power in that, that would be great. And a separate pen light. The total cost of this, maybe $60 US, maybe 75 Canadian. Now this is not actually imaging equipment, is it? This is equipment to actually look at the eyes, but it's not going to take a photograph. You're going to have to make really good notes about what you're looking at. Um, and you're not going to use those notes to ascertain changes because if you've hung out with me for a while, you know that the iris doesn't have markings disappear because of things that we do. So instead, uh, what I tell my clients and my students rather to do is that what they need to do is once they start using this equipment and as soon as they start learning iridology and they start using their equipment, I want them to put a jar on the corner of their desk and they can wrap it in pretty paper or a box or something. And every time they actually look at irides, I want them to put $10 in that box. Right, so if you're doing a consultation with a client, you're a herbalist or you're a nutritionist or you are a aromatherapist or you do something else, but you're looking at their eyes, take $10 from the consultation fee you charge them and put that in that box. Because we want to start saving up in case you decide you want to buy good equipment. So as we look at this, these are images that were taken with a smartphone. You see a million of these on Facebook right now, right? A million of these. And people are posting these and saying, tell me what's wrong with my eyes. What should I eat? What supplements should I take? And it's like, those are all the wrong questions to ask, but okay. And so when we look at these, what do we see? They're fairly decent pictures for a smartphone, actually. This one, what you see is there is a lot of interference of lighting, right? So we've got the top of the eye is more brightly lit than the bottom. We've got some shadows possibly from eyelashes. Uh, we've got lots of shadows from eyelashes actually. And so it's not the best picture because we can't control the lighting here. In the second image taken with the, smart, the same smartphone, it's actually not even in focus. It's really kind of smudgy and messy and just out of focus. Again, we've got uneven lighting. We've got some issues that way and that affects the quality of the analysis we can do. You know, we can say, okay, this person is a lymphatic constitution. This person is the anxiety tetanic subtype. This person is, has an over acid predisposition and a uric acid predisposition. We can see that there's a stomach ring. You know, we can, we can actually see things, but we don't know if these colors are actually accurate. And we don't, we can't assess completely what we want to see because we have no control over the light. All right. So I'm not saying don't take pictures with your smartphone. I am saying don't expect to do a 100% really awesome assessment using smartphone images. It just doesn't work. The lens is not designed to be used up close. You know, I've really tried. These are not images I took. These are images that a client took because they wanted their father to have a consultation, but he lives too far away to come in. Um, but I've tried to get good images with my smartphone. I've got a Samsung Galaxy S8 and it's a really decent camera as far as cameras go, 
but every time I try to get up close to get a good close fit picture, it won't let me, right? It's not designed for close up. It's not designed to keep a rounded surface in focus. These lenses are not macro lenses. So, and it's only a 12 megapixel, maybe a 16 megapixel. So the resolution is not great. We can take these images and we can expand them, but because they are a lower resolution, when we expand them, we are going to lose clarity. And that's not what we want. We want to retain clarity so that we can really work with this. So again, our, our analysis can only be as good as the photos are. Does that make sense? If the photos aren't really great, the analysis cannot be really great either. If you have a smartphone and you want to use these to get, use your smartphone to try to get photos of eyes, um, and Roberta says, what is a good macro lens for you, 60 millimeter? We're gonna get there in just a minute, Roberta. I love that you're the eager beaver today, but we are, we'll get there, we'll get there. I promise, I promise. So if you're using smartphone, you need to do a couple of things. The best way to do images with, of eyes with your smartphone is outside on a cloudy day so that you don't have a lot of reflection, you don't have a lot of bright light, but you've got good, even diffuse light. If that is not an option for you, for whatever reason, I mean, here in Calgary two weeks ago, we were minus 35. There's no way I would have taken a client outside to try to get a picture with a smartphone on a cloudy day. That would be nutsoid. So if you're going to do them indoors, you want a room that has no windows or you want the windows completely blocked because windows really mess up your lighting. You also want it so that if there is room lighting, it's behind them. Because if it's in front, you're going to see this kind of stuff and this kind of um, where the top of the eye is lit unevenly and the bottom has nothing. You want the camera as close to their face as possible. This is really a two person job. You need the person who's having their eye photos done and you want a person taking their photos. To do selfies of your eyes is really, 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 really hard. You'll spend hours trying to get it right. When we are doing this and we're taking a picture of somebody else's eyes, get the camera as close as you can and keep it in focus. You may find that you need to use a pen light or a small flashlight to illuminate the eye and especially to illuminate the eye in certain areas uh, and to move it around as needed. The other thing is don't be afraid to take as many photos as you need to. That is really, really important. Take whatever you need to to get this done. Now, one of the other things that's a really, a really nice little tip is people aren't always super steady, right? And they kind of, they, they don't necessarily have a tremor, but we're not super steady. And especially when you're clicking that button on your phone, if you're not really super, super coordinated, you hit that button and your whole cam, your whole phone does a little movement. So I suggest having the person sit with their elbows on a table or on a small desk and their chin in their hands, that's gonna keep them steady. And I suggest that you sit across the table, so hopefully it's a very narrow table from them and hold your phone with one hand, get it where you need it. And uh, my apologies, we're going to do that. And then from there, you want to just use the other hand to just press that button. Okay, so you want to use two hands to actually get that photo and get it really clean. And if you're both resting on your elbows, that's going to add a huge degree of stability to you. So that's really good. The next level up, and this is not a level I suggest, is to use an iriscope. You're going to find various iterations of these on Amazon and eBay and various websites. I don't actually recommend these. They are priced anywhere from like $97 to $1,000. When I've looked at these online, I've been very disappointed for a couple of reasons. The first is the resolution is usually low. They're usually a one to two megapixel. Sometimes you'll get a five, rarely you'll get a 12 megapixel. So very low resolution. 
The second thing is with these, the lights are always fixed, which means you can't turn any on, you can't turn any off, you cannot change the lighting and you cannot change the, the position of the light in relation to your lens. And so this is what we call fixed frontal lighting. And you will find that uh, if you play with, with even your cell phone and a pen light and you move things around, that it totally can change the features you see in an eye. Okay, and so when we've got fixed frontal, it hides all the contraction furrows. If we could turn off even two of these lights, we would find that the contraction furrows would literally pop. We would say, we'd go, oh my goodness, you've got contraction furrows. You know, I was, uh, I had a student and love her to pieces, um, well-trained, well-trained. She came to me with a background and we just took her to the next level. She had an iridology camera and did not realize that she could change it from frontal lighting to side lighting. So in the, course of our class, we always talk about cameras and lighting, and we spend quite a bit of time on this for the students who have cameras. And I suggested, have you ever done this? And she said, no. And I said, I'm going to give you the challenge to try it. Next client you work with, take a picture with frontal lighting, because we need that. And then take one with a right light and take one with a left light and see what you see different. She emailed and she said, oh my goodness, I had no idea. I was missing seeing so much because I wasn't doing a left light or a right light. I was only doing frontal. So we really need to be able to switch the light. We need to be able to turn it to a left light or a right light and have the option of having both lights on if we want to see everything. So again, because the lighting is locked on the iriscopes, I don't recommend investing in them because again, you're not going to get the complete image all of the depth of field that you want to see doing an iris assessment. Alrighty, so what do we do? There's all kinds of iridology equipment on the market right now, right? And that's great. It's nice to have a choice. I totally agree. Uh, what we need to be aware of as we're choosing iris equipment, iridology camera equipment is what what kind of people are you actually working with? Now that might sound like a strange question, but as you work with, if you work with a broad range of clients, you're going to find that one camera setup doesn't work and that's for everybody. And that's exactly why I have two setups. Let me just um, get this one set up. This first setup is, uh, from John Miles, from Miles Research. Love his stuff. And this one, he prefers working with the Nikon camera, and he can tell you specifically which models because you can buy the camera on your own. This one uses a 100 millimeter macro lens, auto, and I prefer the autofocus, uh, although I don't use that with this. So it's a 100 millimeter macro lens. What we see in here is we have Hopefully you can see this, there are two lights, one on either side, one, two, and there's also a focus light. So we can do left, right, switchable, but we've got the focus light to help us see where we're going. And for those of you who are on uh, Instagram, I'm just gonna turn my camera around. So this is the John Miles camera, or the John Miles illuminator. John is a sweetie. I just absolutely adore the man. He prefers Nikon, I prefer Canon. When I bought this piece, he had me send him measurements from my camera so that he could make sure that the headpiece fit properly. And in doing that, he actually had to custom build the headpiece to fit on my Canon Rebel T6i, which I thought was amazing customer service that he did that. He customized the equipment for me. Now, who would I use this for? This is really excellent for doing iridology photos of very young children and elderly people. Now, why is that? With very young children and very elderly people, they often can't open their eyes really wide. So they literally physically have to prop their eye open. This camera sits about here. Let me just turn my Instagram around again. 
There we go. So this camera sits about here when you're taking the photo, right? And I, again, just use the, the dial on my lens to focus it in. And because this sits far enough away, we can get fingers in to actually open the eye wider. And I have the client do that. I don't do that. I have my client just open their eye. I will give them a mirror and say, um, have them look in the mirror and say, see how it feels. That's how wide we need it to be. Can you hold that for me for um, a few seconds? And of course, if they're elderly, they probably have dry eyes. So we're after every picture or two, they're having to, you know, blink, blink, blink. And then we have to go back to the mirror and make sure it's set up right. But so this is what I love for working with young children and older people. All right. What do I love for working with the rest of my clients? And this works for everybody. It truly does. And I'm not saying you can't use it for people who are not elderly or not young. I'm just saying that's who I prefer that for. This is the, just let me advance my slides here. Oh, this is a picture of me using this showing how we do this. Elbows on the table, client has chin in hand, and we're holding the camera body and the snout of the camera to make sure everything is nice and steady. And this is an image taken with that camera. Now, because I have with that, that, that uh, light, I actually have the ability to turn the light up or down. So if I need it brighter, if I need it dimmer, I have that ability and I love that. I like, I'm a control freak. I like being in control, <laughs> at least in control of the light on my iris photos. This is the, the one that I do use a little bit more just because um, it has some things that I love about it. This is the IE4 from Iris Labs. Now, Iris Labs doesn't make the IE4 anymore. They, they are now making the IE5. And I don't have one of those yet, but I'm hoping that in the next year or so I can upgrade. The big difference between the four and the five is there's some extra lighting controls. Um, and question on this from Roberta, do I have experience or knowledge about the effectiveness of IPix cameras from Australia? I do not. I, uh, it's a brand that I have heard of, but I have not ever experienced them. So I can't speak to them to how good they are or how good the service is or things like that. The, uh, the Iris Explorer is designed for 60 millimeter autofocus, but it also has two tube extenders here. So when we look at this, these two tube extenders give you a total lens length of 87 millimeters. Sounds like a really random number, doesn't it? And so we wanna make sure, and you actually receive the tube extenders with the IE4. So you buy your own lens, order your IE5, which is what it would be now, and you will receive everything you need to attach it to your camera properly. Okay, why do I love this setup? This setup is so amazing. I fell in love with it when I first saw it at an IPA conference a couple of years ago. I actually fell in love with it so much, I didn't have a camera, this camera yet. I was still working with an old eight megapixel camera. And I literally went out to the bank machine withdrew the cash and came back and bought their demo model because I loved it so much on the spot. What I love about this is a couple of things. First off, we've got the two lights. They are left and right switchable. So you can have both or you can have just one or you can have just the other. I also love that by simply holding the buttons, and I don't know if you can see that, hold it down, it changes how intense the lights are. See that getting brighter? I'll do that again for my Instagram people. So we do that and it makes it go dimmer just a little bit at a time. And if we do the other one, it turns it up a little bit. I love that feature. Additionally, this one specifically blocks out all ambient room lighting. So you could be in any room 
and you're going to get really awesome pictures. If your camera settings are all set the same, so your f-stop, your shutter speed, your ISO are all set the same, then this is actually, I'm going to turn those off so I don't, there we go. This is actually going to sit right up against the client's face. It blocks out all ambient light and it means you never have to worry about what's going on in the room, which I absolutely love. Now, again, um, I love this too because it's super compact and it packs well into a very small case that I've just had a case laying around, got the foam and chiseled out the bits of foam and this fits really well into that. And I love this one for mostly for my clients between the ages of 12 and 60, where they can open their eyes really wide on their own. We can, even with this, I can actually, and I'm just going to flip this around again. Even with this, we can have the client just pull down ever so lightly if we need the bottom, or we can have them reach in, lift, and then come in to get the top as we need to. So this is great. Do I use a stand uh, with this one? Or I only use handheld. Yeah, totally portable. And that's what I love. So I'm just doing the elbow thing again and holding the snout while I'm taking the picture. So totally handheld, right? So I love this one for, again, my clients who are ages 12 to 60, which is the vast majority of my clients. I understand that the IE5 is currently on back order. They sold out of their first production run. And I've emailed um, Matthew, Matthew Dahmer, to ask when will they be, when will he have a second production run? There's an image of me using this and you can see again, elbows on the table and the camera is right up against the client's face. I just love this because it's so compact. There's no part sticking out that would get broken. So this is the one, the IE4 is the one that if I'm going to travel with my camera, this is the one because I can fit it into a small case and, um, and nothing's going to get broken. I'm a little more cautious with my John Miles piece, which I adore this piece, but I am leery of traveling with it because I don't want anything, any of these pieces that are sticking out to potentially get damaged. And that is just my bias. I tend to be a little, um, a little cautious with things. Can I use extenders on any camera to make the lens over 60 millimeters? I'm not a photography expert, Roberto. I'm pretty sure you can. The one thing you need to make sure though, is that your camera, I understand there are two different um, sizes of fitting and you just need to make sure that your lens and your extenders um, are the same as your camera and that that is all the same as the IE4 or the miles illuminators and so that's why um, each of these people who makes these cameras has their favorite brand now I have found that that Nikon and Canon are interchangeable for lenses because like I said, uh, John Miles customized his light for my Canon, okay? So when we have, this is an example of switching from left, right. So we've got the first image that we took with both the lights on. And those of you on Instagram, this is gonna be a little harder to see because we're doing I'm going to turn that light off. No, that's the room light. I'm going to turn off my room light. So our picture's going to get a little bit pixelated here. I just want the glare off the screen for my Instagram people. And um, as we look at this frontal lighting, it looks like a fairly smooth eye. Do you notice a difference when we come down to, let me just get this good for my Instagrammers. There we go. Sorry, the picture is tilted. Do you notice that down here with side lighting, we now see contraction furrows? And when we flip the, to the other light, can you see that we actually have layers and layers of contraction furrows that are obvious? So the side lighting is absolutely critical 
to be able to see more of the texture and especially the contraction furrows. This is why the inexpensive iroscopes with fixed lighting is one of the reasons why they're not the best. All right. So um, with that, I love that Roberta's had questions that I've been able to answer for him. Excellent. Thank you for asking questions. I really appreciate that. Just want to give you a little heads up that Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology will be starting again in April. Registration is not open yet. I'm going to run two different courses, and, and this is to accommodate time zones, particularly Australia. There will be a Thursday course that will be 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time which is great for the North Americans. It's okay for London at 6 p.m. London time, 3 a.m. Australia. I don't think so, right? That's not gonna work very well. So I opted to add a second live course that will be Fridays um, from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. my time, which still works for North America. Not so great for London. But if we've got any Aussies who want to take the class, it will be at 8 a.m. your time on Saturday mornings. So giving that, um, just giving a heads up here. Do all the courses take 20 weeks? All of the, yes, Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology is 20 weeks in order to cover all of the curriculum that is required by IPA if you want to certify with them. So all the courses are 20 weeks long. And so this, uh, again, for North Americans, if you have children or if you're doing summer holidays, I'm just going to lob this out there that every class is recorded and stored on your student site. So if you are going to go away for a week or two for vacation or, you know, whatever, um, not a problem. You can make it up by logging into your student site and seeing the actual recording of the class you missed. The, um, for the Aussies, this is through their winter. So this is great. This is, they're not doing a lot of school holidays in the winter time down there. So that works out really well for them. So if you want to be kept in the loop and get first notification of when registration opens, I'm going to ask you to either private message me your email address. And I will make sure you get on a special email list of people who will be notified as soon as registration opens, so they get an advance notice. I only take 10 students per class, and, um, and that will work. You can also, uh, if you're not receiving my emails already, and that's regardless of whether you are or are not receiving my emails, because I'm creating a special list of people who really want to want first dibs. You're not saying you're gonna take it for sure, but you're saying you're really interested in it. I'm creating that special list for them. If you're not currently on my email list, go to iridology.education and there's going to be a pop-up window that gives you the option of opting in for an iris map. And do that and that will automatically add you to my email database. But again, if you are interested in being notified when registration opens in the middle of March, um, send me a private message and let me know that you want to be on that list. Uh, you can um, even, you can do it right here, even if you're on the webinar with me, just go down to where it says, where you're typing messages and uh, where it says all panelists with the drop down arrow, click, um, click on that and it will let you select just to moderators or presenters or whatever it's called. And that message will only come to me. So I will see your email address and I will know that you are interested. So with that, uh, okay, excellent. So uh, on Instagram, um, we've got Manor Holistico asking to be added to this. And so I need to ask you, Manor, are you currently on my list? I think you are. Your name looks familiar. Um, yeah, so DM me that and I will add you to that list. Absolutely. All righty. Um, so that is my take on pictures and cameras and imaging equipment. We need, if we are going to be taken seriously, we need to be using professional equipment. And even for my students, and we've had some students on this, which is really cool, it's, um, it's important for them to know that there's a starting point and there is 
a, a better place to end up. But this is not where we start when we're beginning. This is what we save up for, right? Roberto asks again, is 60 millimeter a de decent lens screen? Roberto, I'm actually not a photographer. So I, I would never use a 60 millimeter anywhere else. I know that the, the Iris Explorer pieces use the 60 millimeter. I know that the John Miles Iris um, illuminators use a 100 millimeter. So I simply have the lenses that the manufacturers recommended. So I, I, I know people tell me I could take my illuminators off my cameras and use my cameras for other things. And, and my feeling is I could and I would probably break things. So I choose to use my smartphone for my other photos and these pieces and this camera only for my iridology work. All right. So those are great questions. So I really appreciate the engagement. And um, yeah, any other questions that I can answer for you about cameras or the course? And uh, if we don't see anything come through pretty quick, we will call it good for today. That was a fun session. All righty, it looks like we might be done. The Agfa lens is not being done anymore. I do not think this is being created anymore. I've looked for it online and I cannot find it anywhere. I've searched eBay, I've searched, done a general Google search and I looked on Amazon. I cannot find them anywhere. You can find one that looks like this that's an 8X. It's just not the ag for brand and it's probably just fine. So for those of you on Instagram, the question was, does Agfa make these anymore? And the answer is no, I don't believe they do. And so you can go on Amazon and see if you can find one that looks like this, that is an 8X, and then you're golden. Fabulous. Thank you so much for being with me today. Again, that was a ton of fun. I hope it answered, I hope I've answered your questions. Jenny's asking, what is that called? I assume you're asking, what is this called? It is called a jeweler's loop, L-U-P-E, jeweler's loop. Because it's the one that jewelers would use and I don't even know how they use it, whether it goes this way or this way, I have no idea. I just know it works really well for iridology. You're very welcome, Jenny. Wonderful. So there we have it. Imaging things, where to start out, where options for where to end up. And um, that's great. I look forward to seeing you again Tuesday at 11 a.m. I don't even remember what our topic will be, but it will be fun and interesting. So I look forward to seeing you then, whether you've joined me on Instagram or on the webinar. Thank you so much, and we will talk to you next week. Bye for now. Oh, Roberto says, I will be here again. It does not matter what the topic is. Thank you. He, uh, Roberto, thank you. I appreciate that. And we will see you on Tuesday, Roberto, and hopefully everyone else. Bye for now.